Hello and welcome to What The Lux with me, Fred Moore. And me, Anand Sharma. Together we lead Matter of Form, brand and experience design consultancy headquarters in London. And this is a podcast that calls time on tired ideas of luxury. And alongside industry luminaries and thought leaders, we explore what truly defines category leading products and experiences. So welcome everyone to this, the very first podcast in our What The Lux series. And we're going to debunk some very lazy assumptions over what makes a timeless brand an unforgettable experience or serve as a product that's truly a leader in its field and leaves an indelible mark in the sand. In future episodes, we're going to go deep into the rabbit holes of craft, design, brand and technology, covering topics across a vast sweep from sustainability to literally unbelievable new cities appearing from the desert in the Middle East to exquisite applications of technology in unexpected places, and much, much more. Before we invite people who actually know what they're talking about to the podcast, I'm going to ask my partner in crime, Anant Sharma, founder of Matter Reform, to take the hot seat and talk about why he hates the term luxury. Anant, hello, how are you? I'm very good, thanks, Fred. Always on cracking form at this time in the morning. (laughs) <laughs> Listen, how uncomfortable are you feeling right now, Anant? I never feel uncomfortable with you, Fred. You always absorb all the awkwardness. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Well, listen, I don't think we need to feel that uncomfortable because we've probably got two listeners. That's my mum, if she can work her phone, which is unlikely, and uh, Juliet, our marketing manager. So we've really got to only perform for those two people. But listen, I should ask, it's our first episode, and I'm sure my mum wants to know um, about Matter of Form and how you came to found it back in 2010. Fred, to call a spade a spade, when you're chronically unemployable, you have to build a business just as a defence mechanism against gainful employment. Can I just say that that is that is true. Um, you are chronically unemployable and that was proven out before that because I'm not sure you ever had a job, did you? I did actually have a couple of quite serious jobs, Fred. Uh, not, not for that long. That's also true, fair. Uh, sorry, uh, back onto it. Yeah, tell us how it started. I was really passionate about design and technology and It was at a moment in time, about 15 years ago, where design was suddenly being taken quite seriously in business. And and I don't think it was taken that seriously before, nowhere near as seriously as design is taken now. And at that same moment, you know, people were having to digitally transform and really think about what their future looked like in, in a predominantly online first world. And there was this sort of perfect storm of luxury brands who needed to tell their story using this more interactive medium, digital technology, and how they could innovate their business models and their service cultures using technology and then the importance of the design layer that really brought customers together and moved them through this brand experience. Matchform was really founded as those three forces. It became really pertinent in business, really important conversations to, to, to be having. Fortunately, luxury brands didn't take any of those things particularly seriously, preferring instead largely to see a website as a slideshow and, you know, e-commerce in some cases is something that could be managed by a sort of, you know, social intern. So it was, it, was, it was challenging because people didn't understand how to buy us and they didn't understand what it should cost, the perils of a big digital transformation program and the risks associated with it. Starts out doing a lot of websites and it wasn't all luxury, I think, you know, healthcare, etc. But um, just, just talk about the kind of things matter of form, you know, what we're up to now in 2022, just to show how it's changed. We have the most amazing breadth of projects at the moment from you know, working with, with governments in the Middle East to deliver connected city experiences, working with you know, some of the most amazing real estate development projects to devise digital signatures and digital twins for homes that seek to chart the life that moves through the four walls, the, the inanimate walls, and how we can create a connection between people and architecture. We work in creative partnership with iconic architects like Zaha Hadid, figuring out what the future of their digital strategy looks like. Our strategy team have been writing the civic code for a new city. We've been working with some of the largest property developers in India, working out the story behind districts. And then I guess there's also the, the absolute joy in the um, in the travel work we get to do and, and the hotels we work for. Yeah, exactly. I'm looking forward to our trip, Fred, to Mykonos next week to, uh, to rebrand an island. <laughs> We found a hotel on an island, Whatever. I should caveat. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a huge breadth across um, real estate, hospitality, lifestyle, retail. And it's just it just changed dramatically from um, essentially websites to, to branding, to innovation, mobile experience, etc. I mean, it's just a completely different landscape. 
Anna, we've got to get to the heart of the matter. So we both work day in, day out for a business that, you know, works for some category leading, dare I say it, luxury brands. And yet you hate the term luxury. <laughs> you've got to you've got to talk about that. I just find it a really stuffy, inactive term. I mean, the definition of luxury is, is about comfort and convenience fundamental definition of it and I just think that actually technology has enabled convenience in most aspects of life you know you can uber whatever you want whenever you want in an instant that's not really what luxury is about I'm not saying that's all it's been about but you know luxury isn't about inaction I feel it's it's moved from an inactive stance to quite an active stance it's about caring you know about quality it's about caring about craftsmanship it's about healthy friction you know, it's about actually engaging with other human beings, about engaging with a brand, about engaging with the world. And to me, the term luxury feels lazy. It feels lazy, it feels indulgent, it feels opulent, but not in a constructive way. And I don't think that's true of any of the luxury brands I know, in, in inverted commas. You know, it's, all the luxury brands I know invest heavily in R&D. They care deeply about people. They care about customer experience. They care about doing things better moving the needle you know they're not they're not prepared to be to be average they want to move the category forward and set aspirations for the rest of their category to follow and they have never been about commercial scale they've been about quality of craft yeah right and they've never engineered scarcity scarcity has always been the byproduct of craft and the fact that you know, that creates limited capacity to produce and unfortunately, I think luxury has all the wrong connotations. It's a convenient word. You know, it tends to work across multiple sectors and it tends to allude to those who lead those sectors. So I'm happy to use the term because it works for me. Yeah, and I think that's well explained. I think also, you know, we would consider luxury not not just, you know, the obvious goods and services, be that, be that a fashion item or a luxury holiday, but we would say that that, that would be a property developer who's constructing this insane new district of a city that can include everything from yes high-end flats and residencies and hotel concepts but to social housing done in a different way altogether but they're designing it to, to be a category leading um, unforgettable really thoughtful experience and and for us I think the way that we've accommodated ourselves to the term and to working for these brands is that it is actually just so encompassing of so many interesting new leading thoughts, ideas, products and services. Tricky subject, this one. I mean, I've seen you get up and talk to a lot of people in a room and, and probably I'd say 70, 80% are enraptured what, why you've got to, what you've got to say, but um, 20% are nearly in tears. Um, talk to me about the people in luxury, the, the sort of people who are drawn to the industry. I think often in luxury, you can counter a stakeholder who is paralysed when it comes to making confident decisions and, and putting their neck out there. And, and there's a bit of a house of cards of people propping up each other's opinions without necessarily daring to say what we probably all know is true. And that can result in quite an inactive luxury industry, old luxury industry. Basically, there's quite a lot of bullshit. Yeah, but I mean, it's definitely changing, isn't it? I mean, I think when certainly 10 years ago, I remember there being much more of this sort of buttoned up luxury persona type we all know. Um, and now I think a lot of talent um, and different kind of people are joining the industry. There's a lot more energy and innovation going on, which is which is really exciting and, and part, perhaps of the way that we've accommodated ourselves to our positioning and the clients we serve. I don't know if you agree with that. I completely agree with that. You know, there's more mobility, isn't there? Like, you know, and, and you know, the luxury products are no longer exist within an echelon that is completely inaccessible to, to, to everyone. You know, you can have a bit of whatever you want and people are a bit more liquid. And, you know, there are reasons for that that are not positive reasons, but people are basically prepared to spend more money on experiences and they're prepared to spend more money on products if they feel that those products are a reflection of their values. I mean, best described by the fact that when we started out or 10 years ago, you know, we're often that we're working to the digital department, which was the side project of an intern. Um, and that's who shouted at us. Whereas, uh, whereas now these brands have incredibly talented and well-funded digital teams or brand teams, that it's a different landscape. <laughs> I'd love to talk about this notion of perceived value. Luxury obviously has experiences or product. They have a high price point, And that's obviously based on notions of perceived value, selling and all the things that are imbued in that. Do you think luxury from that perspective is a complete con? What Rory Sutherland says on perceived value is that 
if a value is created in the mind, which it is, that's quite environmentally friendly. Go, go, go. In what sense? Go on. If you can create value without making products, it's quite good for the environment. You're not churning and burning material products. And I thought that was quite interesting, actually. It was quite an honest, it was quite an honest recognition of the fact that you know, you know, value value exists into the into the products that we imbue with meaning through stories, and those stories heighten value and create status. You know, and that that is the business luxury is in to some extent. I guess that's um that, that that's the interesting point, isn't it? Is that you can imbue value or status in perhaps something previously that was kind of grotesque consumption, um, or, or that side of it, which which none of us are into. But if you're imbuing value in something that you know less is more, it, it's beautifully handcrafted or it's a product that's more sustainable um, of course that's a good thing and I think that's perhaps part of my accommodation with with luxury is that essentially it can set a kind of cultural narrative particularly say in in travel or sustainability in hotels which, which are really bad do commit quite a lot of environmental waste obviously um, and you can change the narrative of the wider industry whereas um, making people buy more fast food is, is clearly not a good use of advertising yeah, I mean, you can imbue value and meaning into anything i mean you know look at the the nft craze over the course of the last 18 months you can literally imbue value into anything and you know what's great about luxury products is there's blood, sweat and tears that goes into those products. There's true R&D that goes into those products. They try and move the needle on on whatever category they exist within in some way, shape or form. And I respect that. You can make masses believe that value exists in unexpected places through manipulative stories and through marketing and through advertising and through scarcity and through various behavioural tactics that are not complicated and have been, have been used by people to create appeal for, for, for centuries probably should touch on the nft thing obviously a lot of in brackets luxury nft items were produced towards the end of last year to the beginning of this year hit the headlines a lot of people saying this is ridiculous this is something that never has never happened before of course that's completely nothing new is it i mean that's um that's been going on since the, the spice trade it was um it's it's called the nut the nutmegs curse and and it, the um, fact is that you could in the 1600s buy a you could trade a handful of nutmeg for a ship and and about a century later i think it was a uh, cinnamon the, the value of the value of some cinnamon was such that you could actually buy an estate or a large plot of land with it and the bizarre thing is there wasn't actually a particular level of scarcity around those two spices but they were seen you know people loved having big elaborate dinner parties that involved these spices and these spices they were a physical artifact or a physical aspect of the food that you're eating that allowed whoever was giving the dinner party a, a, like a sort of you know a right to talk about stories that touched on the four corners of the world which made them seem culturally enriched you know it was permission to basically it was permission to tell a story yeah and it's happened through through history and i think it's basically you can be on the right the right side of perceived value or the wrong side it just depends where you sit and the product that you're talking about ultimately what's in uh, let's not go too deep into web3 and nfts but what what has unfolded before us I think is kind of ridiculous. I think it's completely nuts, to be honest. You know, value that has been assigned to things that I don't actually mean to any NFT. I think it's fine. I understand the notion of why an NFT that is valuable by the sort of traditional means by which you would value art or design is, I can, you can understand why there's a valuable, but how widespread and cowboy it's become and how many people have sort of drunk the Kool-Aid, you know, is I think is, is completely crazy. And but I do think it's also forced us to just reinspect the value of everything. I think a really healthy philosophical debate has emerged from Web3 and NFTs and, and value and where value exists. And, you know, value is a is a component of, you know, where you find belonging and where you find meaning and where you earn status. And I think it's very easy as adults to think we're above, you know, this primal need to find status within our within our group within our tribe but you know the truth is none of us are above it our entire most people's search for meaning is actually a search for status let's talk about the metaverse and, and web3 because there's aspects of the metaverse and particularly gaming that are actually having a big impact on luxury although i doubt many people know it so just just talk about where you think luxury brands should be finding inspiration from the, the old quote sort of life imitates art i think has never been 
been truer. You know, I, I think that, you know, our fantastical realizations of the future, you know, that, that existed in fiction and movies and gaming, you know, those those concepts are now being brought to automotive design, to city design, if you look at what's happening across Neon and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia more broadly, you know, even if fifty percent of some of those designs materialize. You know, they will further how we optimize the living and, and, and the commuting experience beyond beyond anything we know. And, and you know, we're on this train. We've decided to use technology to optimize life. You know, we, that, that, that is what we have decided as humankind. You know, we've decided to, to, to make, uh, make life more convenient and make life easier uh, by innovating the living experience. And actually, I think right now we're just at the beginning of the curve. Like, I don't think we've really realized the benefits of technology in everyday life particularly you know i think we're very much at the beginning of the curve and i think that some of the changes fundamental paradigm shifts i mean do you mean automation and um that side of things you know it just hasn't begun or do you mean in a more vanilla sense of just sort of i don't know normal tech i'm in life by design based on where we are now today technologically right you know like cities are built around rivers because they allow for you know sort of ease of shipping you know that we, we basically most of our society is based on on you know <laughs> urban design and yeah that's this that's just based on factors that aren't relevant at all today you know and in, in saudi arabia and in, in in the middle east there's an opportunity to really rethink life with technology how they those two things work in symbiosis with each other rather than basing it on uh you know uh, ease of trade shipping things like that well, i think that's a really important point isn't it is that you know, we get procured because of the importance design sits above we get obsessed by web three or automation or these technologies or, or this fad or this craze but design always sits above it doesn't it and you solve the design problem first and you use these things to make to make experiences better or life more efficient well, i think the thing that design teaches you is to think about the problem you're actually trying to solve and so much of life is just about progressively improving things rather than actually just rethinking what the reason for that thing is to begin with and customer centric design, you know, even though it always gets cited as a thing people should think about, speak to your customer, know your customer, truly understanding what your customer, you know, what their unmet need is, you know, I think that's that's fundamental to the design process. And I think, you know, a lesson that should be brought into the boardroom more often. And I guess so we we've touched on some of the sort of web three gaming metaverse themes that are impacting luxury um we're also seeing i guess everything's moving out of just designing a lovely logo or design on the outside to really interesting storytelling around what's on the inside but also incredible collaborations you never would have seen me even three years ago tell me about that i guess there's two parts to that the first is that the logo thing logo is a status symbol you know which has obviously become far less important over the course of the last five years ten years and there's this like phenomena called blanding, which is if you look at all of the logos of major luxury brands, they sort of they all look quite homogenous, and um, and they're all of those D to C New York brands, you know, like Water 3.0 or optimized loungewear or you know luggage that's not really luggage, it's a movement, and they've all got logos that look the same as well. And I guess the reason for that is the logo really has just become such a minor artifact. The design is 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 the connection of all of the points of customer interaction that exist. Uh, you know, on the front end and on the back end, it's really about supply chain. It's really about story provenance. The design is kind of on the inside. The design, the kitchen is in the middle of the restaurant. Do you know what I mean? You, yeah. You, know, you need to be able yeah, to yeah. see the chefs cooking the product, you know, and it's like, and I said, customers expect that. Um, and I can attest to your love of good design because you're a compulsive purchaser of, of beautiful things. They land on your desk most days. Um, and I see you sort of twiddling or, or fiddling with something every day. You are obsessed by that. I have a, I have a spending problem. <laughs> exactly but then the way that it's changed i mean that, that's definitely true um in terms of um the, the story of what's within uh, and we're seeing that more and more in the work we do and it's it's fascinating and in really unexpected places but but yeah let's let's talk about collaborations because that's a massive change i mean luxury was as you said at the beginning like so stuffy and and buttoned up and sort of monochrome really in the way it presented itself we've got a client belmond and many others doing it who, who are collaborating in ways you just never would have expected well with like francois bourgeois you know for example that that train spotting sensation yeah he's absolutely classic he's hilarious you know and it's like you've got people like gucci and north face collaborating you know you've got you've got 
You've got Gucci and North Face collaborating together to begin with, which is unexpected. You have, I think it was North Face and, sorry, no, it was Gucci and, and Francois Bourgeois, as well as Belmont and Francois Bourgeois. But I think the point is it's just lightening up a bit. You know? Yeah. You, you, you suddenly don't have this quite austere, quite mystical, quite alluring, quite removed set of brand ambassadors. You instead have, you know, those who aren't afraid to celebrate eccentricity and weirdness. And actually, that's what's really important today. Self-expression, freedom of expression, not being afraid to put content out there that features yourself. You know, I think when we were all growing up, it was like most people found it pretty embarrassing being on video camera and... I, it took me a long time to feel comfortable. See, I just didn't know what I looked like or how I came across for years. You know, we didn't have smartphones. No one filmed themselves unless you were in 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 theatre or, you know, in a band. I suppose you were in a band. What was your uh, 90s sensation text message girl? Yeah, let's not go there. Um, moving on. So... <laughs> Let's now move to um, to innovation and luxury in terms of, I guess, the business model to start with. Traditionally, it was a very, very vanilla um, A to B business model, sell product or service. Uh, and we're seeing like really different stuff happening at the moment. Can you talk about that? Yeah, it was like, it was like save up, buy expensive thing, you know, and it probably held its value for quite a long period of time as well. Um, and now it's like, you know, you sort of buy a car and the screen looks outdated, you know, and gives away the fact it's sort of 10 years, five years old, you know, within that time frame. So I, look, I think I think what's interesting is that I think most business models will move to subscription where possible. And I think that puts a burden on businesses to change their operating models, to, to, to constantly innovate to update their products, to to do what they need to do. Actually, we'll, we'll get to loyalty, but... but... I mean, how, how does subscription look? How does that look for, I don't know, for a, a brand like Dr. Martin's? How does that look for a brand like BMW? I guess it's, it's it's more obvious with the big ticket things, isn't it? So so whether it's people moving from private chat ownership to subscription via services like Aero or VistaJet yeah. or whether it's, um you know, car services. And we know that they've all got subscription services now. And that probably is the future through to, um you know, like rent, rent my wardrobe or borrow my doggy. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm not suggesting the future of dog ownership is necessarily rental, but um, <laughs> you know, you know that the, there are you, you definitely don't have to clean up the mess. You know, I think I think the concept of ownership has been slowly changing over the last decade or two decades. You know, from software and computers, you know, you can you, through to you know, other forms of sort of technology led product and, and now into into areas like fashion. And I think that that's going to create a highly competitive market because you're going to have to fight for loyalty. Yeah, I mean, so so loyalty is the, the big topic, really, isn't it? I mean, loyalty in the old days to a brand or and then I guess you had some sort of, some sort of innovation in terms of actual loyalty schemes, points based or whatever. Now loyalty is the mecca, but it's just really different, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, there is no loyalty. Well, there is. That there, there is loyalty. What do you mean by there is no loyalty? Well, I mean, I just think there's a very, very low level of brand loyalty. Even though brands would like to think that they have a high level of brand loyalty, there's a very low level of brand loyalty. You know, which, which, you know, and it requires constant product innovation and marketing innovation. Um, you know, and rewards back to the customer to make them feel worthwhile to 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 keep their attentions. Yeah, but I mean, sh- surely the opposite is true as well. Some brands invoke loyalty by by doing very little by staying true to, to what they've all, always done you know it's just a uh, when you say it's a, it's a much more complex a landscape for loyalty and it, yes sometimes it involves you know active thinking about it value exchange schemes programs other times it involves really old-fashioned kind of being true to the product in a world where every fad is chased well it, it requires pr- product innovation rather than just marketing-led innovation and i yes. think that yeah, people are just incredibly savvy, and they care about the details and the background and the supply chain and the production techniques that go into an expensive product. You know, people fetishize those things. I mean, look at look at how obsessed people are with, you know, aspects of an Apple iPhone that, frankly, are completely irrelevant. Yeah, yeah, designed from the inside. So, um, and then we, we talked earlier when we were talking about positive applications of imbuing value into something and negative and just being on the right side of it i guess the concept of um well no there's just huge issue an important issue of sustainability comes up in luxury all the time and some luxury brands are really guilty on this topic some are absolutely 
leading the way. We see greenwashing, but we see absolute inspiration. It'd be great to, you know, maybe through the prism of one of our clients, just talk about where we see some really positive things on the environment, on sustainability, wider ESG in the luxury industry. I think people are really incentivized to have a great supply chain and to tend to their supply chain and then talk about it because people care and they're interested in reading about it it's unbelievably dangerous and people will be hung out to dry if they talk about things that they aren't able to live and there have been countless examples of that over the last couple of years and they get found out seriously quickly these days i was at a conference a year or two ago and the ceo of seedlip uh, that non-alcoholic beverage the guy's called ben the one really the, the one guy. you've clearly never tried he, he he made a comment when he was giving a talk about sustainability and he said that you know sustainability should be boring and he said it to make a point and the point is a good one which is it is good to talk about this stuff of course it is it should just be a given as well and you know i just think we live in a world that's where culture where sustainability why where any of these hot topics you know they're almost like linkedin one-liners or or, or headlines that people seem to come up with first before then engineering the integrity behind those headlines. And I think that this is very dangerous, actually, and it comes from a bad place. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I remember also not so long ago being in a, uh, well, just before COVID, being in a, a sort of round table with a CEO of a major international hotel brand. And the topic of, was sustainability. Uh, and the main kind of initiative that year was um changing pens from plastic to uh, pencils um, water bottles out glass in and uh, I think buying five or ten percent of their furniture from kind of a sustainable sustainable supply chain is just so depressing to hear that and I, I have some sympathy it's hard to, it takes time to change these organizations but um, you know conversely we have a client wilderness safaris who are one of the largest owners of land for uh, under conservation in the world and it's incredible how they use commerce to further this insanely ambitious environmental initiative uh, and it's joyful but you have to live it it's the small things as well right there's an example that's always stayed with me which is a major hotel group we're trying to get more people to reuse their towels and they ran two messages across thousands and thousands of inventory one was um, please reuse your towels for environmental reasons and the second message was most people reuse their towels and the social proof message the second message had a 20% increase in uplift on people reusing their towels. You know, while people obviously want to act and behave better to save the planet, people are fundamentally more driven by this primal need to follow, actually. So, Anant, we know you hate the term luxury. We we know there's a lot more nuance and, and a much more interesting landscape in luxury that you've talked about very eloquently, I thought. But let, let's sum it up. Give our two listeners um, some advice on how these category leaders can remain relevant and dare I say it, you know, how they can become timeless, which is a big thing for us at Matter Reform. Timelessness, I think, for me, is is very relevant to, to those within the luxury category. Right? It's like in a world that's gone mad for data and short-termism, really thinking about creating enduring propositions that stand the test of time and rebuke gimmick and short-term trends I think is that's what luxury is all about you know it's about things that stand the test of time for me one of the most important things that need to be on people's radar at the moment is just this move away from talking about history and heritage of course it's important but I think luxury brands have mostly become luxury or become market leaders because they are highly innovative right? yeah and in a world where innovation in inverted commas, is everywhere. Working out what those innovations mean for your business and revisiting the world as it is today through the lens of your founding spirit, right, I think is really important. So, you know, what is the spirit you were built on and what does the world today mean when you look at it through that lens? For me, that's really important. You know, the second is moving from personas to psychographics, really understanding your buying mood. Hey, hang on, what does that mean? A psychographics is 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 um, really simply put. It's 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 rather than thinking about a high net worth as a high net worth who is a certain gender, who drives a certain car, who lives in a certain district. It's thinking about the sentiment of an individual, whether they're sixteen or sixty, and really getting to the heart of what those 
sort of audience sort of profiles there's sentiment that sentiment you know the, the sentiment that you want to find your audiences in what that looks like and using that to be bolder and braver in your messaging and marketing I think that's really important I think there's a lot of timidity in luxury because the stakes are high right you're working out what's next for a business typically that has enjoyed vast success and is respected and it's difficult putting your neck out there when that's the case your success isn't just defined by selling more tomorrow or, or, or selling less tomorrow it's 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 really about the mood of the market and your ability to lead it and define it i think that i think you know we're in this post-covid era where technology has become pervasive in any business and luxury brands you know they've always been about high touch human service They've been about experiences that always ultimately are delivered through humans to humans or are often delivered through humans to humans. And I think in a world which, you know, has been enabled by technology, you know, as we were talking about earlier, the uberification of everything, you know, that human service is really important. However, it's also been digitized, you know, since COVID. And, you know, to, it doesn't matter what age you are, you're on a level playing field, people People understand user experience and how to get from point A to point B. So what is the role of technology in enhancing that experience? That's different for every brand. There's no right solution. Thinking about clienteling, thinking about you know back office tools that support humans to deliver a better service, understanding and logging the preferences of your customers better so you can delight them. All of these things, really, really important. Some of them boring and infrastructure related. Many of them actually just about being a bit discerning. How can you enable touch points through technology rather than using technology to bring marketing-led innovation all over the place, which is often a detriment of brand? I, I guess you're just going back to your point about heritage. You're not saying it's, it's, it's not about giving up on your history or not talking about it. It just has to be contextual to a greater Completely. truth about, about your relevance in the current age. I think resting on the laurels of history it will not be suffered well by by a market who care about what's next. Yes, that's my other big bugbear is um, new entrants to an industry who take an old fashioned English name or two put together to kind of portray um, sort of heritage It's awful happens quite a lot. And just lastly, I guess the really obvious point about timelessness is is related to the importance of design. Customers are bombarded with messages from brands, from brands who think people care about messages that they have to deliver. And, you know, I think that there's a fallacy, which is we need to be on top of every marketing channel and we need to be pumping out messaging constantly and eventually we'll batter audiences into buying products. Actually, people people have got armour to all of this. Our kids will have an impenetrable armour when it comes to what they let in and what they don't. Picking up on even the smallest inconsistency in how a brand communicates, you lose your customers forever. And so craft matters, every message matters. And um, we're coming to the end um, of the podcast. Thank you for putting yourself in, in the hot seat and suffering my questions. So we're going to ask our guests the same four questions each time. Um, you've probably answered the first one, but maybe there's some sort of further colour you'd like to give. What most irritates you about your industry? There are two ways in which I can answer that because I, I think I exist in the design industry slash marketing and advertising industry and also in the luxury industry, which I think is, is very different. But yeah. why don't I talk about agency land first? I yeah. mean, we exist in an industry that is full of jargon. Right? It's like saturated with bullshit and quite a lot of chest beating and quite a lot of awards which I find particularly annoying actually because I feel that many awards are just a scam to get you to buy tables so that people can validate work that wasn't that good to begin with I'm, I'm still sore about losing an e-commerce award to a com the company you built screwfix.com but side point I think there's a lot of in luxury there's a lot of fluff and bullshit right there's there's a lot, a lot of, sort of resting on the laurels of bit of a privileged middle class existence and I, I do think that's all changing where wealth is created is changing people I think there's a call to arms to be confident and brave and put your neck out there and I, I enjoy seeing the dust being shaken off the luxury space great next question so, so what most concerns you about the world we're leaving the next generation if I'm to be honest I'm quite worried about our collective attention span yeah um, 
I- I'm worried about you yours. Know, I, I, yeah, well, I started off from a bad place anyway. So, <laughs> yeah. um, you, you know, I, I think satisfaction in life comes from deep work. I think peace comes from finding flow. And I think meaning emerges from context. And those things require attention. And I think our ability to find moments and to value the time required to engage with topics is 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 diminished people are frantic i think with it with attention and with flow you know will come great things in general but we're like in this notification driven environment it's got to change surprisingly profound answer there i wasn't expecting it so thank you penultimate question if you had to give up your job tomorrow what would you do heaven forbid probably wouldn't believe me if i said handyman so whatever it was i mean i find myself as obsessed with the design of a salt shaker as i do with signage you know i took me two and a half weeks to order a new kettle um <laughs> pro- product design architecture something to do with design or I'd, or I'd sort of pack it all in and sort of you know try and become a traveling dj yeah i think you'd be more successful in the former <laughs> <laughs> and lastly intrigued to say what you're how you answer this one is um what, what's the most exciting thing for you in the next five years i'm actually very excited by augmented reality yeah Aug- augmented reality and, and virtual reality you know vr ar similar acronyms they, they tend to get thrown into the same soup but they're completely different vr is taking yourself out of the reality in which we live to find an alternative reality and augmented reality is really layering context into the reality that we engage with every day and and, and that is that is you know perhaps similar forms of technology in some ways, but a completely different, a completely different impact on life. And I think augmented reality needs to be taken more seriously. I think it can add, a, you can experience is far more enriching, whether it's understanding your built environment, whether it's understanding art, whether it's understanding music, whether it's understanding your health, culture, how you travel, to take our eyes from our phone and to look at the life around us. And to be able to do it with added depth and meaning provided in a way that feels seamless, I think is deeply exciting. Ah, you old hippie. So listen, Anant, thanks very much for for doing that, for putting yourself in the seat. It's been great. Thanks, Ren. Thanks so much for listening. This has been What The Lux. You can find us on socials at Matter of Form and drop us any questions or comments on Twitter using the hashtag WhatTheLux. And if you're a luxury brand looking for strategy or design that goes beyond the banal, get in touch via hello at matterform.com and chat to one of our consultants. And so, until next time.